please discuss the role of biotechnology or agriculture technology as they relate to plant breeding, biodiversity, genetic engineering, pesticide management, soil management, water management, and animal management. How have advances in these fields developed in a positive manner? What potential pitfalls may exist as a result of further development? And that's a really big question, and I, I'll give you a fairly short answer, because I think that biotech has been heralded as a wonderful solution to our to providing food, you know, like the world hunger. It, it, the idea is that it's solving world hunger by being able to produce food cheaply in great quantities. You have these huge mega farms that require very little labor. So, I mean, you see the countries that industrialize their agriculture end up with many fewer, much fewer percentage of their population working in agriculture. So that frees up people to do jobs in technology, advance all those, all those things in AI and all of that sort of stuff, you know, more um, getting to a more advanced state in the society because you don't have to devote so much labor to growing crops. And so that, you know, you could argue that's a feature. What I think it's causing is, you know, a great increase in all these different diseases. Um, medical costs are going way up. So you don't really save money on, on food if you're gonna spend all that money on healthcare. And of course you're feeling sick too, so you're not happy. So it's really a very nasty trade-off to say, I'm gonna have cheap food. And at the same time, I'm gonna be sick and I'm gonna to have to pay a lot of money to get medical treatment. And then I'm gonna be suffering from all these diseases and all these symptoms. It, it's, it's not a win when you look at it that way. How important is sunlight to our health? Should we wear sunglasses? <laughs> I hate sunglasses. And I actually, when I see a little child, a little two-year-old in sunglasses, I, I, ha I have an urge to rip them off of his face. I don't. I act very polite. But <laughs> uh, I think that um, we have been taught that the sun is, uh, is toxic and that we need to avoid it at all costs, stay inside, wear long sleeves, put on sunscreen, you know, wear sunglasses, keep, protect your eyes. I, I ne never wear sunglasses. I have no issues with my eyes. You know, I haven't even had a, you know, they have to do these... Uh, <laughs> surgery for cataracts. I don't have any problem with cataracts. And I've been out in the sun a lot. My eyes have gotten plenty of sunlight exposure. My eyes are healthy. I'm, I don't even wear glasses, you know, very healthy eyes. And, uh, and it frustrates me that people think they're protecting their eyes when they're probably actually harming them because the eyes know how to use the sunlight very effectively. And actually the pineal gland behind the eyes um, makes sulfate in response to sunlight and then it uses that sulfate and attaches it to melatonin and ships melatonin sulfate out into the cerebral spinal fluid in the evening to prepare you for sleep. And that melatonin sulfate is essential to help you sleep. As you know, melatonin is a very important sleep agent and it's providing the sulfate to the brain to help it clear debris, clear cellular debris. And so when you get Alzheimer's, you have a defect, defect in ability to clear cellular debris. And that is likely because of a deficiency in the sulfate that is being provided normally through the melatonin sulfate triggered initially from exposure of the pineal gland behind the eyes to sunlight. In your book, Toxic Legacy, you present stunning evidence based on countless published peer-reviewed studies that glyphosate plays a major role in skyrocketing rates of chronic diseases, including cancer, gut dysbiosis, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, autism, infertility, and more. You describe glyphosate's unique mechanism of toxicity that slowly erodes human health over time, as well as its impact on soil ecosystems and the nutritional quality of the nation's food supply. Please tell us more about this. <laughs> yes, that's a big, big topic. And this is the, the core topic of my book that will come out in June that I mentioned earlier, Toxic Legacy. Um, my belief is that glyphosate is uh, acting as a glycine analog. Glycine is an amino acid. It's the smallest amino acid, one of the basic coding blocks of uh, coding units of proteins. And um, glyphosate is a complete glycine molecule. So it is also an amino acid, except that it has extra material stuck onto its nitrogen atom. And that extra material makes it behave biophysically and biochemically very differently from glycine. But it doesn't keep it from fitting into the socket where glycine is supposed to fit in the code so that it can end up in the proteins where the code says, I want glycine here, because it's a DNA code that codes for the protein sequence, the amino acid sequence in the protein. When the code says, I want glycine, if there's a glyphosate molecule available, it will fit into the slot. It will add it into the, integrate it into the protein that it's making and then change the characteristics of that protein. 
And if this is true, it's absolutely stunning and it has enormous consequences and it can explain all these diseases. I can take each disease one by one and say which proteins would be affected by glyphosate in this way to cause this disease. And that's the game that I've been playing. And it, it, everything fits like hand in glove. It's actually quite remarkable. Once you assume that's happening, then you can explain why it's causing fatty liver disease and why it's causing diabetes and why it's causing high serum cholesterol and why it's causing Alzheimer's and autism, all those diseases. You can find specific proteins that you can predict would be disrupted by glyphosate to cause that disease. And many of these proteins that I'm finding are actually have been shown to be suppressed by glyphosate. Proteins that I would predict it would mess up in this way have been shown experimentally to be suppressed by glyphosate. So the whole thing packages up quite in a, quite an amazing fashion. And that is the what my book is mostly about. What are your predictions for human health in the year 2032? <laughs> I hope there'll be some of us that are still alive. <laughs> it's looking really bad to me. I mean, I think, and I actually think COVID-19 is a reflection of glyphosate. I really believe that um, COVID-19 uh, bad outcomes are caused by chronic glyphosate exposure. Those people who are getting sick, sickest with COVID-19, have all these comorbidities, you know, various diseases that are, are associated, particularly diabetes and high blood pressure and Alzheimer's, being all of these uh, cancer, all these diseases that are uh, risk factors for bad outcome are also highly correlated with glyphosate in terms of the rise in our, in our um, population. And, um, I think glyphosate, I have a whole chapter in my book on glyphosate and the immune system. And glyphosate, in my opinion, is a train wreck for the innate immune system. And so what's happening is that we're all becoming immune compromised and different people to different degrees, depending upon how much glyphosate they've been exposed to and what their genetic makeup looks, up, looks like, what their gut bacteria are doing, all of these factors play a role. But we're, we're getting sicker day by day. The entire population is getting sicker. And you can see the medical costs are going up dramatically. The United States can't figure out how to pay for all its medical expenses. And they never ever mentioned the idea that maybe we could find a way to be healthier so that we would have fewer medical expenses. And of course the medical, uh, est medical establishment is thriving. I mean, they're making so much money. They don't necessarily want us to be well. I mean, they're happy to have us sick, it seems to me, because they make money when we're sick. And so there's no motivation um, to fix the problem. And uh, this really frustrates me because if we could just get our society to recognize that you just need to do healthy living, it's very simple, eat organic diet, eat whole foods, you know, get a lot of uh, micronutrients in your diet and get out in the sunlight. It's very simple and, and you'll be well. And, and people need to get that message because I think it would make for a much, much better world if we had everybody practicing a lifestyle like that.